Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about how we can match the supply of agricultural science students with the demand for agricultural science students, and it's quite a complex story. So, did anyone see Julian Cribb's article in the Sydney Morning Herald yesterday? It was actually titled, Hunger, the New Barbecue Stopper. And these are the kinds of um, headlines you don't see very often, unfortunately. Um, and what it said was, food scarcity is emerging as the most cogent risk to civilization in the 21st century. Water and land have become targets of new global gold rushes. And in the meantime, the world has spent three decades slashing its agricultural research and training efforts. Um, and really what we need to do is increase agricultural productivity with um, less resources. This is a huge challenge, and he saw only one glint of hope, and that was that enrolments in agricultural science courses in Australia and other countries have suddenly surged after decades of stagnation. Now, I don't know if you knew I was giving this talk today, but really these are the kinds of things that I wanted to talk about. So, um, as a high school student in 1974, which must seem a very long time ago to the previous two speakers, um, I was terribly inspired by um, the devastating famine in Bangladesh and the first UN World Conference that was held in Rome in that year um, to try and address hunger. And those of you who are as old as me might remember Henry Kissinger saying, within 10 years, no child would go to bed hungry. And I wanted to be part of that action. I wanted to contribute to getting rid of world hunger. And I thought one way to do that, and I was very passionate about biology, and in my case it was plant science, um, and I wanted to do that in that way. So that's what inspired me really, was my school science teacher, school biology teacher in high school, and the fact that there was something really big that I could contribute to, something really important. And I guess what I'm really concerned about today is that I wonder whether we are preparing our future generations for these challenges that are with us now and that lie ahead. So I'm going to talk to you about the supply chain from education to employment in agricultural science, what the outlook is for agricultural sciences and how we might maximise the chance of success. And I want to remind you that we're talking about starting here with that little girl in primary school starting to learn how to add numbers. You might even be starting earlier, but we'll do for now. So I'm going to take you through the supply chain. Now, most of you in agriculture will be familiar with supply chains, about how we're producing products of superior quality to meet a particular specification. And to do that, we can influence all stages of the supply chain um, in different ways. And the way that we influence those will tell us if we come out with what industry or the consumer, in many cases, wants at the other end. We always get told we need to start with what does the consumer want. So what is the current situation um, with industry demand for agricultural scientists? Well, first of all, as I've said, the challenges are enormous. And um, we are really in a situation now where we've got to increase productivity in a time when it's been declining with l using less resources at a time where we have issues of um, energy security, climate change, um, water shortages and soil degradation, etc., etc. I think you all know that story. So we need to be more innovative and we need to be more productive. And the way we do that is with very smart people. Very smart people that understand the nature of the problems that they need to address. And at the moment, we have 700 of those graduating a year from our agricultural science faculties. According to Jim Prattler, he's done a huge amount of work in this area. And I know that an earlier speaker said there were 2,000 jobs, but I have read different numbers, and there are somewhere between two and 6,000, but probably about 4,000, for which we should ideally would like to have agricultural scientists apply. In 2010, only 40% of those positions were filled. Um, and I'll leave the next point because it's a little contentious. Um, but I will mention that science graduates are often not regarded as valuable employees. So um, I don't know if anyone else saw this in the Fin Review yesterday, but the um, Business Council of Australia has recently done a survey of its members 
to look at the satisfaction of employers with specific graduate skills. And there are some things they're very dissatisfied about. And they include things like planning and organising, initiative and enterprise, knowledge about their chosen career and job, self-management, teamwork, um, problem solving. There are a whole range of things that they believe that graduates can't do. And I was talking to probably many of you know Mike Stevens the other day, um, who runs the biggest agricultural consulting firm in Australia. And he said this, you know, this fact that the public sector is pulling out of extension is a bit of a disaster. And, you know, we know that we're going to have to fill that gap. But, you know, I get these brilliant science graduates coming and applying to me and they know a lot and they've got, you know, fantastic results. I know what they know, but then I ask them, what can they do? And he said, there are very few that can tell me what they can do. They can tell me what they know, but I need them to do. So we need to think about that side of things. And uh, there's a lot of work going on at the moment in the space that I'm now in, which is in the Chief Scientist Office in the Innovation Department, Innovation and Tertiary Education Department, looking at those kinds of issues. So there's an issue there, but the agricultural industry is changing to become much more technology based. And we really do need very good science, science and mathematician kind of people involved in our industry. And we also need to remember that um, just like in um, agriculture itself, the farmers, half of all agricultural scientists are nearing retirement. So we're going to have a gap in our research capacity. So what are the sorts of things we can do about that? Um, well, first of all, to me, one of the most important things that we need to do um, and I know that Rebecca was saying that we need education to explain to students what careers are out there, but we need to ensure that industry has ownership of this issue as well, because industry is the place where you can get these careers, where you can find out about them. We need industry to explain to people um, in universities and schools what it is that they can do if they do this certain sort of degree. And we also need to make sure that graduates are employer ready on the other side. We need industry to tell us what they want, we need to present attractive and well-defined career pathways, and I think Rebecca hit the spot there. Um, everyone knows what you can be if you be a doctor, but no one really knows what you can be if you study science or agricultural science. And it's very unclear to people what their career pathway is, and most kids and most parents of kids want their child to do a job where they will earn a certain amount of money in a certain amount of, you know, at a certain kind of level, where they'll have a stable career, um, where they won't be unemployed. And it's pretty clear that if you become a doctor or you become a dentist, that won't happen to you. But hell, what's an agricultural scientist? We don't know what they are, especially if we live in Sydney or Melbourne. So um, the other option, of course, is um, attracting experienced molecular biologists, mathematicians, ecologists, engineers and natural scientists from other disciplines into agricultural science. Um, there are many of those out there that aren't able to work in their, their field of their PhD, for instance. Um, who could be dragged into agricultural scientists with a bit of um, imagination and, and inspiration. Um, I, I was speaking to um, Patrick Hone, who runs the Fisheries R&D Corporation, a little while ago, and he said, we don't care about that anymore, we just import them. So at the moment, 50% of our scientists are imported. I don't think that's very fair to the countries we import them from, but science is global. We need to think about, is this we want to keep, what we want to keep doing? But on the other side, there is a huge value in a science education. So just quickly, um, some of the things I'm talking about will become apparent through these graphs. If you look at the red arrow, it shows you where agricultural science is on the median starting salary of bachelor degree graduates <coughs> in 2011. So you can see that why most parents would prefer their child to be a dentist, an optometrist, or an earth scientist, or a doctor. And here you can see, and this is contentious data, um, but it says in this data um, that um, after six months after finishing their bachelor degrees, 30% of agriculture scientists are still looking for full-time employment, whereas um, very few lawyers and dentists were. Um, uh, Jim has explained to me that um, that data might be very high-level data and include a lot of um, in mostly environmental science graduates, so I'm prepared to be convinced about that data, I'm not sure that it's right and it doesn't really make sense in the context of the numbers of vacancies and the number of applicants. But the question really is, so why would you do agricultural scientists when you could do dentistry? And that's really, the, the answer to that question is not entirely obvious, I think, to a lot of children. And m I myself, um, I ha my father was a doctor, 
I was pressured from year 11 when I showed that I had great talent in science and biology um, to be a doctor. Um, you know, stable career, good income, um, lots of opportunities. Uh, when I said I wanted to do science or agricultural science, um, especially having a mother who couldn't wait to get out of her dairy farm where she had to milk cows every day, um, I was, you know, my parents couldn't understand why I would want to do that when I could become a doctor. And I was a rebel. There aren't very many rebels about. In when I was doing my first year science degree at university, I think there was me and one other person that weren't doing science because they didn't get into medicine and were trying to get into medicine. So how can we inspire our youth the way that I was inspired um, to start to think about these alternative careers? And I think one of the ways is to make it very clear what they can do at the other end. I've had probably, you know, most of my friends did medicine and I've had a much more exciting career than any of them. Um, and they're very jealous and envious of me. But how do we get that across? So let's go back to the supply chain. We're starting in primary school and a recent um, survey, um, I think it's the Prime Ministry's Education Foundation, has found that 75% of primary school students think that cotton socks are made from animals and 27% are convinced that yogurt is plant-based. So we've got a problem already. Um, and why is that? Well, science receives an average of 2.7% of teaching time. There are many schools in Australia, in primary schools, where we learn no science. And that's largely because 90% of teachers have no scientific background and hated science at school and were so glad that they could do primary teaching and never have to have science again. And 68% of teachers don't feel confident teaching science. Um, a recent survey actually in the UK has found that um, most children want to be a vet or an astronaut um, but they hate science and maths and find it very difficult and boring, so they'll probably never get to be one. And in Australia in particular, we have a major issue at the moment that we're falling behind in international testing in science and maths, and I'll talk to you a little more about that in a little while. Um, but it's actually of a major concern when you think of our country being probably the luckiest country in the world, falling behind in international testing in science and maths in the technological age is a bit of a disaster. So what can we do about it? Well, there are some obvious things we can do. We have to make science and maths interesting, fun and relevant. Um, we have to engage children's natural um, curiosity. We have to give teachers the tools and the confidence to teach science. And we need to, um, in this agriculture area, um, focus much more on explaining the sorts of things you can do with agriculture and how exciting agriculture is. So they're the sorts of things we can do at the primary school level. I'll just quickly show you these results for those of you who are not familiar with them on primary school um, year four testing, TIMS testing, which is the international one sort of international testing. Um, and you can see that Australia in the top is where we are in science in year four, and the bottom is where we are in math. So we're really not doing ahead, and we're behind countries like Portugal and Slovenia, Hungary, and it's kind of depressing, really. So let's go to secondary school. Um, in secondary school, we have a real problem because enrolments in sciences are in quite serious steady decline. So compared to when even you, or you and I went to school, very few kids are doing sciences in school. Um, and similarly, while many kids are doing maths, very few are taking the high level maths which you need for subjects such as engineering and many sciences. Again, our world ranking in science and maths internationally um, is in decline in secondary, at secondary levels as well. And surveys have shown that there's a complete lack of appreciation of many students, particularly those that don't study science, of the relevance of science. Students see science and maths as boring and very difficult. And because we've now virtually abolished all prerequisites for science and maths in university courses, they think, well, it's boring, it's difficult, and I don't need it, so why would I do it? And so it's just declining. Um, and I keep coming back to this poor understanding of the career structure and opportunities. So unless they want to do medicine or dentistry or something really clear, um, they just don't really get this science stuff. So they have to be made keen on science for some other reason or shown what the career opportunity is or both. Um, teacher qualifications are a real issue. Um, for instance, uh, I think 43% of physics teachers in Australia only have first year physics. So they're only one year ahead of their year 12 students. And the average age of teachers is a bit like the average age of farmers. It's now 47 and um, that's actually a real issue. So what can we do about it? Well, we do need to support our teachers. 
um, to teach more interactive and inspiring classes. We need to make children love science. And we have to do that in very clever ways. And we need to teach meaningful science rather than a collection of facts. How is science relevant to your life? And help children understand why science is so important. We need to ensure that teachers are adequately qualified and passionate. Many students like myself are inspired by their science teachers at school. Um, and we need to provide them with the appropriate support and training to do that. And we need to incentivise science and maths graduates to become teachers. So we have teachers that really understand what they're teaching. We need to make it fascinating, and people have said to me we need to make it sexy. Um, and we probably need, you know, more headlines, like um, that one I just read out before, Hunger, the new barbecue stop-up. People need to start thinking about these issues. And we need to continue programs such as Pixie, because those kinds of programs are helping children, which is particularly for agricultural science, understand what agriculture is and all the opportunities that are in it. So coming back to international testing in high school, you can see that we're doing a little better than we were in primary school, probably because um, in science at least, they teach science in high school much more than they do in primary school. Um, but the results of the PISA testing, which is a different kind of testing, also show that we're not doing well. And the worst thing about the PISA testing is we're dropping in our ranking. So there are many countries ahead of us who we used to be ahead of. So let's go to university now. Um, only 0.5% of students study agricultural science and there has been a steady decline in enrolments, um, which is the red line, and completions, which is the blue line, <coughs> between, um, since 2002. Um, Julian Cribb apparently was right because Jim Prattley tells me that he's expecting that in 2013 there will be a, an increase in enrolments, but we don't know for sure yet, but it looks like it will be quite substantial but on a low base. In 2010, only 743 graduates were graduated compared to 100,000 from China in agricultural science. And something that I didn't know until I started looking into this is that the satisfaction in agricultural PhDs is actually not very high, which is something that we can fix. We can do something about this, and I'll talk to you a little more about in a minute. So what can we do? Well, first of all, defining career pathways is really important. People need to understand what they're getting themselves into, and so do their parents. Improving the links between industry and graduates for the same reason. Improving PhD and postdoc programs and revitalising agricultural faculties and teaching. And I'll talk to you about why that is. So here are the enrolments and completions. Looking pretty bad, but apparently they're going to go up this year. Well, the enrolments, not the completions. Um, this shows um, the different um, disciplines. I won't go into that in too much detail. Um, other than to say that the line that's going up is environmental studies, not agriculture. This shows the domestic completions in doctoral degrees. Um, you can see that we're um, graduating, you know, not too many more than 100 a year. And this is the postgraduate research experience questionnaire. So the red line is agriculture. Um, agriculture's got about an 80, just over an 80% um, overall satisfaction compared to all those other courses in front of it. At least we were ahead of law. So why is that? And the reason for that is um, these are the criteria that make up the satisfaction um, score. They're supervision, so only 69% of... Um, the black line is a PhD and the grey line is a master's degree by research. So only 69% um, of students um, doing research PhDs were happy with their supervision and only 61% with the intellectual climate, and only 70% with the infrastructure. So here are things that we can improve, and perhaps we can go back and talk to the students we have now and look at ways <coughs> of working on these issues. Um, that, because what those students think is going to influence whether someone wants to do a PhD next year and the year after. And we need more agricultural <coughs> science PhDs. So what is the outlook for agricultural scientists? Well, first of all, as I said, the outlook is not restricted to agriculture. Between 1992 and 2009, the proportion of Year 12 students taking physics, chemistry and biology fell by 31%, 23% and 32% respectively. That's a big drop. Agricultural science is dependent on a supply of science and maths literate graduates from school, but so are all these other disciplines. And as I've already said, 
optometry, pharmacy, medicine and dentistry having no trouble attracting science and maths graduates. <coughs> it's some of these other areas that are having trouble and um, that's um, perhaps a good reason why we should talk to those other disciplines because now in this position I have um, in the Chief Scientist's Office, every day I have someone from engineering or ICT or physics or maths coming to talk to me saying, we just can't get high quality graduates, we can't get enough, what are we going to do? And we are doing something about it. So last year um, the Commonwealth announced $54 million of a whole range of programs to train teachers and inspire students in science and maths. And some of these programs are now underway. And as well as that, um, Inspiring Australia at Questacon recently did a study and found um, that there were 411 science engagement activities between January 2011 and June 2013. And I met with um, the, Aus the Australian Academy for Technology, Science and Engineering on Friday and they tell me they've done a study that shows that there's 1,018 of these things. So I guess my plea to you here is in trying to get, grow the pool of science and math students who are going to t transform into our next um, generation of agricultural scientists. We need to coordinate with those other fields that are trying to do the same thing because the fragmentation at the <coughs> moment is probably not optimal. On the other hand, um, I think it's still really important to continue the sorts of programs such as FITSI so that students understand the particular um, opportunities in agriculture and particularly important to get industry involved so that students understand what that is. So um, I don't know, I'll just quickly put this up because many of you may not be aware of the Research Workforce Strategy 2020 and Beyond which is a Commonwealth Government strategy that's um, aiming to ensure that Australia has the quantity and quality of researchers to meet our needs, is looking at enhancing the attractiveness of research careers and increasing participation in Australia's workforce. So if you're interested in finding more out about that or participating in it, um, you could come and talk to me or to someone um, in um, the department where I'm situated. So how can we maximise our chance for success? Well, these are the strategies I see for success very quickly. First of all, on the supply side, we clearly need to create a large pool or a larger pool of highly skilled students who are maths and science literate and attractive to agriculture. On the demand side, we need to develop and communicate well-defined and attractive career paths in agriculture together with employers, tertiary institutions and government. We need a collaboration, a collaborative effort to do this. And finally, um, collaboration is the most important, um, first of all, in implementing the research workforce strategy and the range of science, technology, engineering and maths programs with all interested sectors. What we really need is a coordinated, strategic, national approach so that we can achieve that goal of preparing our future generations for the challenges that lie ahead. <coughs>